then we are live. Good. Well, welcome everybody to the. Uh, what are we at, Adam? Up here, the sixth Google Hangout, fifth. The fifth, I think. Fifth Google Hangout for asset pricing. I'm John Carpenter, teaching the class. Uh, we have uh, Adam uh, at the University of Chicago and Nina at St. Gallen joining us, and uh, we're here to answer everybody's questions. Now we have questions teed up from the forum. Uh, if you're watching this live, feel free to uh, send in some more questions. Uh, or if you, let's see, if you, if you, is there a way for them to actually join the Google Hangout if they want to do it live, Adam? Yes, there is. If they send an email to me, um, and the email address is assetpricing.uofc at gmail.com. So assetpricinguofc, okay. And it's, the email address is in the beginning of the form thread. Then I can send you the private link, and you can join our conversation. Good. But in the meantime, we have a bunch of questions teed up via the forum already. And Adam and Nita to help me both ask and answer them. So what do we got, Adam? Well, first of all, we have a question from Tao, from a question uh, related to the homework from last week. Tao asks, um, thanks, Nina. The, uh, the list helps a lot. I have two questions. First, in the Hangout video, Professor Cochran wrote, P is equal to expected of x star and x. Um, this is slightly different notation from what I saw in the lecture, where the formula is P is equal to E of mx. So in the book, it's P of is E of mx, and, and m is a random variable, while x star is, is x star deterministic. Um, so is P equal to E of mx equal to is uh, it the product of x star and x? Yes. So do, can you see the equations? I, I, on my handy whiteboard here, I tried to write up the equations. Yeah. Is that big enough for you guys? Yes. OK, so what about these two? Which is right, which is wrong? Um, is x star therefore deterministic? Uh, in general, no, x star is not deterministic. Um, the difference is e of mx is the uh, <coughs> Uh, this M, uh, I don't want to talk too much generality. M could be marginal utility growth, and M is not necessarily, it's, it's a random variable, but not necessarily also a traded payoff. So the classic example of this formula is M is beta U prime of CT plus 1 over U prime of CT. And that, what are its properties? It is a random variable, but not necessarily a, a traded payoff. Uh, when we are in a, in a complete market, of course, everything's a traded payoff, but there isn't necessarily, can't necessarily buy a security that pays off marginal utility growth. That's the properties of that. Now, what are the properties of X star? Uh, X star here is also typically a random variable, uh, and it also is a payoff. Um, so both of these things are true. It's a good thing to remember that there are multiple things that can be a discount factor in an incomplete market. There isn't a unique discount factor. There are many discount factors. And our friend X star is the discount factor that's in the payoff space. Now, how, do you, how, do you, how are these two things related? Um, uh, uh, I'll give the equations way, and then I'll give the graph way. Uh, the equations way is, um, let me go from here, uh, if that's true. We can also always decompose a random variable into, no, I lost, uh, I lost a picture here. Are you guys seeing me still? Yes. Yeah. OK. We're still seeing you. Uh, you can always decompose a random variable into its uh, projection of m onto the space of payoffs plus a residual times x. So all I've done here is I've decomposed m itself into the projection on the space. And, and that's just a definition. The residual is m minus the projection onto the space. But definition of projection, this is linear regression, the, uh, this, the product of those two things is 0. So in fact, that guy is x star. And what I've just reminded you of is the proof that starting from p equals e of mx, we can find a, uh, a payoff in the space x star uh, such that e of p equals e of x star x. So they're not the same thing. Uh, that is typically a random variable. This is a regression, run m on the space of all payoffs. The fitted value of the regression is going to be random as long as the payoff space has some randomness in it. 
So it's another random variable that also acts as a discount factor. It's the mimicking portfolio for, well, the mimicking payoff for M. And this is this is why we have um, macro finance models that think about marginal utility growth and use consumption data. We have things like the Fama French model or the Black Scholes model, where we use it, discount factors that are themselves recovered from asset returns, and, and this describes the relationship between those two. So. The answer is going on a bit, but this is a really important question, important thing to clarify. Uh, let me try to do the geometrical uh, version of this. Um, let's see, I'm going to have to erase. So you imprint all that on your mind while I find my eraser. It would probably help if you turn a bit the billboard on the left. Wait, what do you want me to do? Yeah, yeah, now it's great. Now, now it's great. Yeah. Is that better? Okay, thank you. No, because I, I can barely see anything here. Uh, this I don't need. Um, and so let me remind you from, from lecture how that works. Uh, the, I love this geometry. Some people love it. Some people hate it. You can do the algebra. You can do the geometry. It's completely up to you which, which one you find intuitive. But the same proposition, let's have a payoff space. Uh, let's do a proper payoff space and not get things wrong here, which would always always useful. Um, so here's our, our, our axes. Let's have a payoff space that, say, looks like this. There's a payoff space X. It's not that I'm doing incomplete markets, so it's not the entire set of payoffs. Uh, zero is a payoff here. There's there's various payoffs. These are these you know lots of different payoffs, uh, but all all along the line, they're all generated as as more or less of a given random variable. It's a space. You got to include <coughs> like the space of returns, which isn't a space. We've done that a few times. Okay, so M might be out here. Um, the projection of M, that would put our friend X star there. That's the projection of M onto X. This is the residual. Notice the residual is at right angles to, to X. So if I have any payoff, let's take a specific payoff, uh, a payoff in X. There, there's a payoff X. And the point, what these say in inner product language is that the inner product of the vector the inner product of that vector. So this is the vector m. The inner product of m with x is the same as the inner product of x star with x because the residual is at right angles. So that's m. That's x star. X star is a random variable. This this is this is state one and state two. Only in the special case that we were generating this from the risk-free rate would would this not? I mean, x star is different in state one than state two. So it's a random variable. They're both discount factors. I guess one more last point. There's a whole space of potential discount factors. Anything on this line is a valid discount factor. In this case, M is positive. Uh, there's some X stars out there that aren't positive in some other states of nature. I think I've reviewed the whole M and X star thing to death. Adam, Nina, anything to add? Uh, anything you can see that might be confusing our, uh, our questioners? I remember when I did this the first time, I found it very confusing at first. So I, I think that it's, it's important to keep in mind, but, but this is a different way to express what we've already done in math. So there's sort of this, uh, but, it, but it, at least for me, it, it helps intuitively to see it's drawn out. I think that's, that's uh, for me, a, a, a takeaway. So I asked uh, Adam and Nina to sort of help, because I've been doing this so long, I forgot what's confusing. And Adam and Nina's job is to help explain how it was confusing when they first did it. So I'll tell a little story. I did, when I started working out this diagram stuff, I went into Lars Hansen's office, all proud of myself, with the diagrams. And Lars Hansen wrote the papers that, that did this inner product notation, not just the papers that did the equations, the whole inner product notation. That's Hansen and Richards, L2, and so forth. And, and Lars looked, I put this up on the board, and Lars looked at me like I was out of my mind. He had no idea what I was talking about. So. It can confuse even Lars Hansen himself. That's, uh, <laughs> but then it's simple when you're all done. Nina, how are you doing here? Uh, I should say that I still find it confusing. So I still hope um, one day I will find it very simple. But it's not right now, this day yet. <laughs> well, uh, can you help articulate? This, this is where we need to help our students. Can you help articulate what's confusing? I mean, the, the way, of course, you always. Uh, our, our questioner had the, had the right approach, was when is something is confusing, you try to isolate what the paradox is, and then you make the paradox go away. So can you, can you put any words to what you still find confusing about, about this 
with this set of issues? Um, I think that I don't understand how understanding, full understanding of state space geometry would help in practical applications. Well, we got a long way from practical applications here, didn't we? <laughs> um, uh, uh, I, so where, what kind of things do we find it useful for? I find it useful for just uh, suggesting, I, I always find it important to understand why the statements of theorems uh, are, uh, make sense. And so I can give you an example. Uh, this is, uh, so I'm not sure if this is going to qualify as practical application, but, but let me, let me show you one that for me at least, uh, uh, makes the state, it made the state space geometry come alive. And, and here's the theorem. Uh, now, of course, getting theorems right uh, like this at 8.30 in the morning is, is hard. Um, maybe I'll do... Uh, I'm rethink I'm not going to come up with it. Uh, let's see. Can I can I do this while I'm uh, while I'm doing it? I'm one minus the projection. Yeah, here it is. Of one onto uh, x star. Uh, okay, there's there's a theorem for you. R e star is one minus the projection of one onto x star. Going, what the heck? Where did that come from? You know, how would you pot? Now that turns out to be true. You do five lines of inner product algebra, and you go, "Oh yeah, right." But why would anybody ever think that something like that might be true? Aha! Well, let me try to do the drawing version of it for you, and then you go, "Yes, of course, that's right." Uh, so let's have uh, let's have there's our our e space, and therefore there's our r space, and uh, there's our friend x star. And then uh, one is going to be something like there. There's one, and there is the projection. This is down here. Uh, that's our friend R E star. So oh yes, of course, R E star is. Let's project one onto X star. The projection of one onto X star is over here, right? So one. Minus this here is projection of one onto x star. There's one minus projection of one onto x star equals r e star. I dare you to dream that one up just by looking at algebra. <laughs> I, 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 I wish I could have a picture because uh, needed space is expressing more confusion than ever. So I've completely failed in my job to say this uh, helps to explain things. Look, uh, there's there's al this is the whole point. There's algebra, there's graphs, these are entirely the same thing, and whichever representation helps is right. There's certainly no case, I can't make a case that one is more powerful than the other. In fact, the graphs are much less powerful. The graphs are a finite dimensional special case, whereas in fact the equations are an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. There are in fact places where you can go wrong, where the, the equations and the graphs differ. Um, these sets don't don't always have interiors. Um, with the positivity stuff, you can go wrong. You can think, for example, um, there's an example where it goes wrong. Let's see, do I have room on the bottom here to preserve this? Uh, let's go back. My my previous example, we had an x star here, and then I I graphed the set of all possible um, discount factors m. There's the set of all possible discount factors. And here is the set of all possible positive discount factors, right? This is the m's greater than zero. Now that makes it look like there's a limit on the variance. The, the, remember, e of m squared is just the length of that vector. So it makes it look like there's an upper limit on the variance of m consistent. So this is a hanson jagannath We're deriving here a hanson jagannath bound with positivity. That's the fancy words for this. In the graph, it looks like there's an upper limit on the variance of m, as well as a lower limit on the variance. The lower limit on the variance of m, this is this is the, uh, oh, I guess I graphed it wrong, x star 
also has the property that it minimizes e of m squared is minimized. It looks like there's a maximum. It looks like there's a maximum e of m squared up there. Now that's wrong in infinite dimensional spaces. Uh, so there is no maximum e of uh, e of positive m squared. The graph makes it look like there is one. So uh, let me try to summarize here. I went on way too long. Graphs and equations are just two different ways of looking at the same thing. If you find the graph confusing, forget the graph. Just do the equations. Um, and graphs, since they are finite dimensional, can lead you wrong about propositions in, in infinite dimensional spaces, which is where we are. So remember always to check everything with the actual equations, not just the graph. Nina, how, do, how am I doing on? Um, really, this is a stumbling block. Um, this is important to, to, to try to find. Me. It's like we have a friend here, Nick. No, not yet. I am. Yeah. Hi, John. Hi. Well, welcome to us, Nick. Now we're not seeing any video from Nick. And Adam, are, are you are you on? I'm still here. Nick, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you guys. It's just that I mean, I'm not switched my video on. I'm okay. That's okay. Why why don't you introduce yourself? Where are you from? I'm from London, the United Kingdom, and I'm currently a professional market. I'm also doing my masters in finance from University of Warwick in London. Great. That's all. About John I have had the pleasure of listening to him in the past at Chicago School in London. Oh, thank you for showing up for that. Uh, what, what Nick isn't saying is that I gave a talk in London a while ago, and it was during the finals of the World Cup. So uh, only truly devoted people uh, showed up for that talk. Nick was one of them. I'm very appreciative. Uh, Nick, what can we do for you? Can you think of a, a question? What can we help you with? Uh, I, I'm basically doing the similar course in my curriculum in finance, and I mean, I'm finding that very, very difficult, obviously. Uh, yours is also from a very, very quantitative background, and I'm not from a very quantitative background. So I'm just the kind of thought I will just listen in and kind of try to make the most of it. I wanted to attend the previous calls as well, but I wasn't able to because normally at this time of the day, I would be at my work. With this 430. Oh. Go, go ahead. Have we lost Nick? Nick, is there any particular question that you have about the, the coursework or the material that you would like us to address? I mean, at this point, I didn't have any particular question because I haven't been able to follow the coursework properly as I would like to. So I don't have at this point. OK, well, uh, thank you for joining us. But uh, it, it, as long as when you're with us, if things come up, please chime in or if we're not making ourselves clear. Uh, Nina, do you have one from the forums uh, ready for us to go? Okay, let's start from the uh, forum thread for today's hangout. Um, the first question is from Andy, who is a background in physics. Okay. Um, last week, somebody asked about risk neutral probability. And I have a question that is somewhat related. Could you briefly comment on the Ross recovery theorem? In particular, what are the recovered probabilities? Under what conditions do they agree with historical probabilities? What use are they in as pricing? And can they be used to test if the utility function is valid? Okay. Um First, Nick, can you mute your mic uh, unless you want to talk to us because you're, you're giving us some background noise. Uh, the Ross recovery theorem. Uh, this is a big controversy going on now. Um, there is a, a response paper from Lars Hansen and Jose Schenkman, I think. If you can read the Ross recovery theorem paper, you can read the Hansen and Schenkman response. Um, I haven't studied it in that much detail. The central issue is really uh, down to the nature of probability. So for since not everybody in the forum is up on this whole big controversy, um, but it, there is an important issue that, that regards uh, the forum. And, and the way, so the way we've thought about probability um, and the underlying randomness in the economy is, is best described as a tree. Uh, so today, um, it, could, it could rain or shine. Now, I'm in California, so it's always shine, shine, shine. But I guess uh, uh, um, uh, Nick, Nick is, uh, no, Andy is in, uh, in England, so it might rain or shine. So there's some actual 
but then, so then, uh, then the next day it might rain or shine as well, and so probability, uh, the states of nature, the underlying state of the economy, always goes like this. That's the uh, the way we've been thinking about uncertainty in this class, uh, and the traditional way of, of thinking about uncertainty. Uh, my understanding, this is from reading it about three years ago, the Ross recovery theorem fundamentally thinks of probability in a different way. There are uh, two possible states of nature, and you can completely describe everything you need to know about the economy by, by one state variable that, in this case, I mean, his takes infinite states, but that there's one state variable. It's either rain or shine, and today is either rain or shine, and then tomorrow it can be either rain or shine, the next day it can be either rain or shine, and, and so forth. Um, but when you're in the rain state today, the past history doesn't matter. You forget about everything. No, nothing matters other than is it raining today or is it shining today. Whereas this state of nature is, is distinguished not by is it raining or shining today, but it's distinguished relative to that state of nature by the entire history that got there. So this state of nature is it rained today. Uh, let's see, that was uh, I'm doing rain up and shine down. This is really the state of nature, rain today, shine yesterday, rain the day before. It's not just the day rain or shine. So what Ross showed is, is that uh, you can recover the entire M. We can't recover M from asset prices. Uh, you can recover the entire M uh, in this kind of probability. Uh, but the, the, the problem with it is that most asset pricing models, that's the nature of probability. So that's all I want to say about the Ross recovery theorem, at least because if I try to make it up as I go along, I'll probably get something wrong. Uh, it's it's a vi it's in our theorems about is there an M is there a unique M when what can we find M it's uh it's, it's if nothing else an indication that research is going on and, and there's an interesting controversy that uh, I'm going to stop here because it, it wasn't even and I didn't even put it on the final exam so <laughs> uh, guys uh, anything if you, are you aware of this anything I can add that is useful to especially useful to the average student in the context of what we're doing in the class right now. If there are any of the students that are, are more interested in this, they can go into the, the forum because there's a couple of the PhD students who are taking the class, um, Charlie and, and Flavio, I think, who are, who are debating the recovery theorem on, on the forum as well. Um, and Adam, have you read, I have not read the Hanson Schenkman response to the Ross recovery theorem paper. Not yet. It's on my to-do list, but luckily my to-do list is always very short. So. Yeah, well, the problem is reading Hanson Shankman papers. They write them faster than I can read them. So, and, and I have to do something else with my life. Uh, they're always great, but you know, but uh, those of us of limited brain power, time is short. Uh, maybe you can put the find the paper and put the link on the forum, and and maybe the company uh, can figure it all out for us. Let's go into something else. Especially if you guys have something, I'd like especially to to have things that are useful for students struggling with this week's material. I had a comment on, on the last question, so the price is equal to E of mx, and, and sometimes we observe m, and it's a payout, and, 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 and sometimes we don't. I remember when I studied the material first time, I it was sort of conceptually difficult to figure out, well, what generates then movements in prices, should I say? Well, what kind of movements in prices come from movements in m, and what kind of movements comes from movements in, in, in cash flows? And are there ways for us to, to decompose those? Ah, uh, well, so, um, first of all, we are going to put on our, our asset pricing hat where we, we forget about general equilibrium for a minute and think about these things as, as causes and exogenous and so forth, and the price as the endogenous fare, right? Uh, we, we all know that's not. There's a whole general equilibrium set of asterisks that let's do it, and you're exactly right. Um, then, uh, I mean, these are the stories we tell about asset prices. Why did the price of Apple go up yesterday? Well, either because uh, the market uh, changed its expectation of Apple's future cash flows, the iPhone, iPhone 7 is going to be great, or because the discount rate in such cash flows uh, went down. Uh, this is easy. Uh, another 
it's always best when, when you have a question, it's always best to frame it as a model. Uh, my favorite economists are the ones where I, I ask them a question, I can see through their eyeballs that gears are turning and they're, and they're thinking in terms of a model. And, and you should be like that too. So uh, another version, there's, there's another discount rate we've looked at. We, we've looked at P equals, uh, let me do E of uh, 1 over R. <laughs> That's a discount factor that, that works very well, and I'll, I'll say PT plus one. Plus, well, let's just let's make a one-period model here. Uh, so we've done the one-period model. Uh, let me make that DT plus one, RT plus one, PT. Right. That that's a discount factor here. The definition of return is is DT plus one over PT in a one-period model. Um, so this is a, I think there's a problem set on this. RT plus one is a candidate discount factor. There are lots of discount factors. A graph to confuse Nina. Um, there's, there's our friend X star. Uh, there might be an M. And, and one over R, uh, uh, one, one over R could be here. It's, it's not necessarily X star, it's something else. But this is useful because uh, this is an example of what we talk often about. Uh, expected cash flows went up or expected returns went down. So um, this is a discount factor model we use. This is the heart of the Campbell-Schiller linearization, uh, one of the most famous discount factor models around. Uh, have we, did we play with that or is that coming up? In the, I forgot what we've done what we're doing next. Have we, have we done the Campbell-Schiller linearization, guys, or is that first week of next, uh, next time? Or do you not remember either? Adam, Nina? I don't remember. Coming up. I think it's coming up. So very soon we're going to do a linear version of this model. So this is a great time to introduce the idea. With this, this discount factor, then we can say things like prices went up because expected dividends went up, or prices went up because expected returns went down. Uh, this is what, you know, when, when commentators say the Fed's going to lower interest rates, that's going to help the stock market. What's the mental model? Well, part of the expected return is it's RF. Plus, uh, let, let's make a, you know beta e of rem if you'd like. If the risk-free rate goes down, then the expected return goes down. The discount rate, uh, the, the uh, discount rate changes, and and the price goes up. That's that's the kind of thinking there. So, Adam, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wandering around. Have I answered your question somehow, or or helped students understand these things? Yes, yes, you have. I've, Hi, I've, John. I'm not able to see the blackboard. Ah, uh, Adam and Nina, can you see the blackboard? Mm, most of it, yes, but maybe a bit again on the left. If you turn it a bit on the left, then we can see the rest. Yeah. No, I can only see his picture, but not the blackboard. You're seeing a static picture if I wave like that. Do you see? Yeah. Wave? No, it's okay. just a static picture, which you probably a profile picture. Ah, okay. If you're seeing a static, that means, uh, huh. Adam and Nina, are you seeing me moving or are you seeing the profile picture? Nope. No, we I think what the Google Hangout does is when you're running into ba bandwidth problems, uh, then it stops showing the picture and starts showing the profile instead. So right. I'll just leave that there, and, and hopefully uh, those of you who are having bandwidth uh, issues, it will come back in time for you. Uh, okay. Often, often, often what happens is that you can watch the video again on YouTube so after uh, we've run the, the live version, all of it will be available on YouTube and on Google Events. Um, and there, there hopefully shouldn't be any bandwidth problems. Uh, Nina. Yeah. Uh, talking about this week's material, I remember that last, uh, that last two years ago when I took the course, the homework on conditional and unconditional frontiers was somewhat difficult for me. And um, maybe you could... Um, say a bit about the difference between conditional and unconditional frontiers. Um, how do they differ? Yeah, this was kind of a mind-blowing thing for me too, and uh, brings back for me weeks sitting with the Hanson Richard paper. I think it's about three pages of that paper that I spent three weeks of my life on trying to master, and have been inflicting the pain on students ever since. Um, so. Uh, Let's see. Let, let me try to. Um, uh, there's a big picture here. I mean, one sense of why we're doing it uh, 
uh, one of the integrating principles of this class is that in asset pricing, uh, there are many different ways of looking at the same thing. And one of the things I'm trying to do is not so much teach you asset pricing as, as link together the three or four different ways that people use to talk about the same thing. And then often they're talking to cross purposes. Um, so there's continuous time and there's discrete time. We've done both. And, and hopefully one thing you've learned from the class is, is to be able to jump back and forth a little more between. We've done risk neutral probabilities and, and real probabilities. Oh yeah, which we were supposed to talk about and we didn't. Uh, and that seems like a language where some people say risk neutral probability, some people say risk premium, and you go, how do we make this uh, the same thing? Well, we've, we've, we spent some time on, on going between this. So that's a preamble to uh, why are we doing mean variance frontiers? Um, because we've talked about three, there's three different representations for the idea of I have an asset pricing. There's, there's, there's uh, P equals E of MX. I may have a, a discount factor, M, that generates prices uh, correctly. Then there's the statement uh, of expected excess return, uh, E R E I is beta I times lambda. There's, there's some factor uh, such that if I run factors, expect the returns equals betas and lambdas. And then there's the statement, uh, I have some RMV that's on the mean variance frontier. <coughs> Now, now, those look like three completely different things. And the point of this section of the class is to unify those, to understand that a discount factor is the same thing. If I have an M, you know, if that, then I know how to get from that representation of that representation. Uh, and conversely here, the Roll theorem tells us that if I have a return on the mean variance frontier, then that return is itself a factor that satisfies this representation. And then from that, I can construct a disk. You can now go back and forth through these three apparently different representations. That, that was the preamble. Nina asked, no. Nina asked a question about conditional and unconditional frontiers. I haven't gotten around to answering that question yet. What I gave was a preamble of why, you, why we care about conditional and unconditional frontiers. So one reason we care. Then we went into conditional asset pricing models, uh, the statement that there is that, you know, ET, PT, ET of M, X, that these things could vary over time, that the X's could be augmented by X times Z, where we have, have uh, X, that's at XT plus one times ZT, managed portfolios, uh, conditional betas, conditional factor risk premiums, and that, of course, relates to something on a conditional mean variance frontier. So that's one reason we were studying it, just to round out that, that thing. It's also important, though, because so mean variance frontiers uh, finally, I'll get to say something practical. Uh, Nina challenged me on practical about 20 minutes ago, and I haven't done anything practical all day. Uh, in investment, man investment management is still permeated by mean variance frontier thinking. Um, and it's kind of interesting because investment management is permeated by time varying portfolios, by, by managed portfolios, by jumping in and out of securities, and mean variance frontier thinking. So. Is it on the conditional frontier? Is it on the unconditional frontier? You know, what should you be doing? And there, I think this week's uh, the homework involving the advanced frontier. I think is is particularly interesting and worth the pain it's going to cost, because there I ask students to think through what is the time varying portfolio that gets them on an unconditional mean variance frontier. Um, okay, with all that preamble, let, let me now. Uh, I do always feel the need to sort of put things in their big context. Let's talk about that conditional and unconditional frontier. So, so what they are, uh, I think the biggest thing is to, is to identify what they are. The conditional mean variance frontier is just um, uh, sigma t of, of return versus et of return. And let, let's do excess returns, because life is always much easier with excess returns. And uh, then you know, there's always something that looks like that, <laughs> right? That, that uh, in excess. In excess return space, it's always a V shape. I'll remind students of that. Why it's not a it's not a you, you remember from your classes something that looks like that, but that is for returns, uh, not for excess returns. Excess returns zero is always an available excess return. So therefore, excess returns is always a V shape. You don't have to go through uh, this business that you had to go through with with actual returns. 
OK, so there is such a thing as a conditional mean variance frontier. And uh, I think the way to think about this is not so much as time uh, going on. Um, there's, there's you, you wake up in the morning. Uh, wake up. Let's see. How can I do wake up? Alarm clock uh, goes off. Uh, ring. You know, the, that's an alarm clock ringing. You wake up in the morning. You, f you read the newspaper uh, news. Uh, that gives you news about ET sigma t. And then uh, you go ahead and uh, invest. Uh, invest. And then the day goes by. And by the end of the day, uh, see, this was supposed to be 6 a.m. Uh, so there's 6 a.m. Uh, end of the day, the clock says 5 p.m. We all go home. There's there's my clock. With I need to do a better bell that time. Uh, 5 p.m. Go home and you make money or don't make money. Okay, that's don't don't think about it so much as time is 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 as uh, so. The conditional mean variance frontier is uh, you get the news and you can invest given the news. So as of this moment here, there's a an et versus sigma t. And it shows up and looks like that. But it depends on the news. It might be a day where that's what the news looks like. Or uh, 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 you might be, after you read the news, you might be facing a, uh, a different. You might be facing a, a, a better mean variance frontier. Here's ET versus sigma t. I hope. Can you guys still read this? How are we doing on reading the graph? It's OK. So when, when the news comes up, it, the news says, hey, this might be a great day to invest. Or the news says, this might be a bad day to invest. So what you're going to do is, is you're going to read the newspaper, and then you're going to make an investment, right? And so, for example, if it's well, let me let me let me start. This is a good enough example. Uh, so I'm going to just start all over again. So you, what do you do? You, you wake up, wake, uh, wake, and you get your coffee. Uh, then then there comes news. Uh, and the news tells us it's one of two days. It's a day like this with a, a, a big sharp ratio, ET, uh, there's ET and sigma T, or it's a bad day to invest. It's a, it's a low sharp ratio day. Uh, ET and, uh, versus sigma T looks like that. Now you get to invest, invest, you get to see that news, and then, and then you get to earn your money. So. The conditional mean variance frontier is, after you've seen the news, the set of investments that you can make. And you're, what you're going to do in this situation, you're going to make a state contingent plan. right? You're, you're, if, you're going to, if it's a bad news day, you're gonna, the optimal thing to do is to invest not so much there and to invest a, a lot here. right? Isn't that intuitive? Make a plan. Wake up. If it's, if it's a day when investment opportunities are good, put a lot in the market. If it's a day when investment opportunities are bad, don't put such in, so much in the market. I'm, I'm trying to make this practical, Lena. Now, but, but to what question is that the answer? What is the qu it's obvious in this situation what you want to do is invest more here and invest less there. But what, why is the, right? What's the question to which that is the answer? Because these are both on their mean demands frontiers. The question to which that is the answer is how do you get a portfolio that is on the unconditional E versus sigma? There is out there somewhere an unconditional mean variance frontier. And so um, what you're trying to do, this, this might be a payoff on the unconditional mean variance frontier. Now, how did you get, we, we figured out that that was the optimal thing to do. How did, uh, you know, to invest more here and less there? And the idea that that's optimal, well, that strategy, invest more here and less there, must be the way that you do the best in an unconditional sense. So think what we've just figured out, <clears throat> that a payoff on the unconditional mean variance frontier will be on the conditional mean variance frontier. Now, what do I mean? A payoff is a, a contingent strategy. It's a, it's a plan. I'm going to get up. I'm going to have my morning. I'm going to think through my plan. My plan says if it's a good news day, invest a lot. If it's a bad news day, don't invest much at all. And that's got to be a good plan. That means it's a good plan for maximizing mean versus variance before I see the news. What is my, my plan for doing as best I can during the day? Well, that's unconditional because I haven't seen the news yet. 
So a state contingent, and, and what's the, what are the payoffs? The payoffs are not just invest more or less. The payoffs are, are managed portfolios. The payoffs are listen to the news and then invest more or less. So this is a this whole thing is the payoffs that I'm thinking about here. I'm thinking about what are the plans I can make that would then uh, maximize this unconditional mean of variance. So this is not just I'm going to put three dollars in no matter what. This point here is the point I'm going to put in five dollars if it's good and one dollar if it's bad. It's not a static portfolio. So to be on the unconditional mean variance frontier, the kinds of objects that are on the unconditional mean variance frontier are state contingent plans. In good news day, invest a lot. In bad news day, invest a little. And the, each of those plans is on its conditional mean variance frontier. The opposite is not necessarily true. Now here's a state contingent plan. The state contingent plan here is invest the same amount no matter what. So this one, I, I, I tried to put it so that uh, you wake up in the morning, you ignore the newspaper, and you just put in $5. Now you can see that's inefficient, right? Nina, you have the, the most confused look in the world, so you're going to have to help me out when we're done here. This plan here is invest $1 no matter what. Ignore the news, invest $1. Is that conditionally mean variance efficient? In this case, yes. I only have one asset in this example. So it's conditionally mean variance efficient. Once I've woken up, it, it's, you know, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But you can see that it's unconditionally inefficient. It's going to be it's going to be in here somewhere because I'm not taking advantage of this opportunity to put more money in on the good days and on the bad days. So that's an example of a payoff that is conditionally mean variance efficient, but unconditionally not mean variance efficient. And that's the central, it's because of the language. You're used to thinking that the, the language, you're used to, it is certainly true that E of ET of X equals E of X. Now you're used to thinking of conditional mean means unconditional mean. And, and here, since there's a maximization involved, that's not true. Here's an example of something that is conditionally mean variance efficient, but not unconditionally mean variance efficient. So, the review. The big confusion about, the, what are the big confusions here? One big confusion is not understanding that the set of payoffs I'm considering when I wake up is not just invest a dollar and, and, and or is how much am I going to invest. The things that I'm thinking about when I'm waking up, the payoff space is not just how much am I going to invest unconditionally. The payoff space is a plan for after I see the news, how much am I going to invest. So big confusion number one. Uh, often people think about, when they think about the unconditional frontier, they're mentally thinking, I, I'm not allowed to change my payoff space weights when I get the information. That is not the, the, the payoff space. The payoff space is, I wake up in the morning, and I know that after I get the news, I'm going to be able to make my investment. So I'm looking for the set of, of what I'm going to do in both states of nature to generate that. So that's confusion number one. You're not just talking about fixed weight portfolios. You're not waking up and saying, I'm going to put in a dollar no matter what. You're waking up and making a plan for how much you're going to put in in the two states of nature. And we're talking about the unconditional mean variance efficiency of that plan. That's confusion number one uh, when, when thinking about this. Once you get that idea that the payoff space is the plan for what I'm going to do in each, in each step, then I think it makes a lot more sense. That was way too long a lecture for way, uh, but but Nina, how am I doing? I, I know. Is that right? Yeah, I think it's great. And just a follow-up question. And this variable uh, z that we add into equation, it is responsible for defining the plan. Yeah. Yes. So that I get the news. So in the equation version of this, I get mm -hmm. the news dt, uh, and and zt is what tells me is it high or low. And so, based on the new ZT, then I then I can invest more or less. So that the kinds of payoffs, if we have, if we start with a, if we start with a payoff space that's R E T plus one, then the set of payoffs that I'm thinking of unconditionally are payoffs of the form Z T R E T plus one. That is the set of payoffs that I'm taking the unconditional mean and variance of. And the Z is crucially important. It's, I get to put more money in if Z is big than low. It's not just RET plus 1. 
which would mean I have to decide ahead of time how much money to put into it. That's what I call the, the mean variance frontier fixed weight portfolios, and that doesn't enter anywhere in, the, in, in, in this correspondence. So the key confusion is, I'm just saying it the third, I'm, I'm going to be like the American tourist. Who, they don't understand, I just say it again louder. <laughs> Nina's seen a few American tourists. Uh, the key confusion is not understanding the payoff space. And the payoff space is, I'm waking up in the morning, I'm thinking about my, my I'm trying to make a plan for what, what will maximize my mean and variance given you know, what I know in the morning, and that plan is, if it's good news, do something, if it's bad news, do something else. And the means and variances I'm talking about here are the means and variances of plans like that, not the means and variances of just, I decide in the morning how much to put in each other. That's the big confusion. Most people think unconditional frontier means I'm not allowed to change the weights when I get the news. That's not the case. I am allowed to change the weights when I get the news, but I take the unconditional mean and variance of that plan. Thank that you, Eric. Yes? That was good. OK. I guarantee you many of our students will be, uh, uh, yeah, right, uh, this Sunday night, uh, <laughs> many people will suffer this confusion. You should come back and, and watch that spurring speech. Yeah, I think this would help a lot. Uh, right. Uh, I sorry, go ahead, Adam. I remember when I first read this, I, I thought that this is all good and well. Invest a lot when there's a high sharp ratio. Invest little when there's a low sharp ratio. But what if I am sort of endowed with a mandate that says that I have to invest a, a certain a number amount of wealth every day? So I am the the, the, the asset manager for the PhD students in Chicago, and they have endowed me with a million dollars that I have to invest in the market every day. So sure, I have a model that produces me a C every morning. I wake up, I turn on my, my model, and my model produces, oh, today is a high sharp ratio day, or today, today is a low sharp ratio day. How can I use the knowledge from, from class to invest the savings of the otherwise poor PhD students? <laughs> That's a great question. And the answer is, drum roll, these are excess returns. The amount, in this example, the amount invested every day is precisely zero. There are excess returns, zero cost portfolios. Now, the answer to your question is on top of this, so the actual amount invested is the risk-free rate plus the zero cost portfolios. So really what we're doing here, by doing excess returns, I made it simple. What, what your poor PhD student is with $10 invested, the question is how much of that do I put in stocks and how much do I, of that do I put in bonds? So we're not changing the overall amount invested uh, in this example, we're changing the risk exposure of the PhD student. Now, uh, many investors do have mandates that say you'll always have a beta of one. <laughs> and that's a, that, you know, well, why would you want to do that? <laughs> because you are taking more risk in this state than that state, because the rewards to taking risk are better. Uh, and there's a very deep analogy between time shifting of risk and asset shifting of risk. Um, you shall always have a beta of one, meaning you'll always be on the black dot, no matter what you think of the opportunities, is like saying you shall always invest 60% in the stock market, even if you think that Greek bonds are the great, wonderful opportunity of a lifetime. Well, you know, you go across space into the good opportunities, that wasn't investment advice. Go across space for the good opportunities, or go across time for the good opportunities. If you limit your abilities to do that, you're, you're going to limit your, your performance. Um, a deep kind of, it brings to mind a deep puzzle. Uh, uh, is this shifting, uh, knowing when the market is going to go up would, would be immensely valuable. You could do a lot better in mean variant sense if you knew that it was a good day to go in and out, just, just going in and out of the market portfolio. The red is better than the black. That's knowledge every bit as good as knowing which stocks are good. Uh, and, uh, you know, and this takes advantage of it. But did I at least did I answer? This is a great example of how you how you solve confusion. You find a paradox and you track down the paradox. So Adam's paradox is well. Wait a minute. I've always got I've got to invest one dollar. The answer is these were excess returns, not levels of returns. So that solves that paradox. I hope that solves that paradox. Unless you had a different one in mind. That was it. Nina. 
It's fine. Excuse me. So this one is on this week's problem set, as, at least as far as I remember. Uh, and, and that's the answer. At least that's the intuition of the answer. Uh, our students are asked to find the actual, uh, the, to find the numbers. And what the students will find is that in order to do this, what they, they have to do precisely this. They have to do more in the good state and less in the bad state. And then they have, they have to think about uh, what that one does. And that one turns out not to be so good. I, I forget exactly where that dot is, but I remember it's inside the frontier. I have one more paradox <clears throat> from, yeah. from the, the forum. Uh, some, somewhat related. This is from uh, Lamachan. Lamachan is at the University of Groningen in uh, Holland, in, the, in, in the, uh, the Netherlands. And he asks, I'm, I'm still a bit puzzled about the whole conditioning down and, and managed portfolios story. Isn't the mean variance efficient portfolio in a model where we have constant parameters also a managed portfolio? So here, I, yes, I, I mean, you constantly need to rebalance to get the same optimal weights over time. That's a great question. Um, so yeah, uh, okay, let me erase here. So let's think about a case. Uh, there's, there's, right, there's, uh, let's do excess returns. Uh, and here's our mean variance frontier, uh, ET of RE versus sigma T of RE. And let's, let's just say RE is IID. There's absolutely no conditioning information whatsoever. Then if you want to hold a mean variance efficient portfolio, it's going to be there. The conditional frontier, the unconditional frontier, everything's the same. This is the classic portfolio case. It might say, you know, 60%, the classic advice is 60% stocks, 40% uh, bonds. Uh, and uh, if that's what it looks like today, <clears throat> then looking forward, that's what it looks like tomorrow, right? Now, uh, what that means, however, is you, this is the classic portfolio advice. We'll, we'll do this portfolio theory, the first day of portfolio theory. We'll do, X, we'll do IID returns. Then there's a formula that says that the weight uh, in stocks should be 1 over gamma times uh, expected return uh, over a variance of return. And uh, if gamma is about 2 for our risk aversion coefficients, that says 60-40 uh, uh, is the advice. And it's the same 60-40. Yeah, here's, here's, uh, here's, here's Langen's puzzle. Uh, suppose you hold 60-40 and then stocks uh, are 60% are of the market cap. And then tomorrow great news happens, you know, the Eurozone crisis ends. And the market weights go up to 80%. You, you, it goes up, so stocks go up. Uh, so now it's 80%, 20%. Right? You wake up tomorrow morning, your stock portfolio has exploded, it's 80, 20. So what do you do? Everybody's standard advice, you rebalance, right? You sell off, you sell off 20% of your stocks, you rebalance, you get back to the 60, 40. Because our portfolio theory said 60, 40, the world's IID. Here's the puzzle. I sell. You sell, Nina sells, everybody's doing the same thing. We're all trying to sell. Who buys? We cannot collectively rebalance. This advice, although given everywhere, as if everyone should do it, cannot apply to the average investor. The if market's gone up to 80%, the average investor has to hold 80% stocks. So if you're rebalancing, you're taking an active position. You're doing something different from the average. It's a zero-sum game. You're selling. Somebody else has to buy. Who buys? Is that a fair summary? That's at least the paradox I want to. I know how to answer. Is that something like a fair summary of the paradox that that was posed? I think so. Well, how do we solve that paradox? IID world. Stocks have gone up to 80/20, so everybody has to rebalance, but everybody can't. This cannot be right because somebody somebody has to hold that extra value of stocks. I, I like this puzzle, and, I, and so I'll be honest, it took me three years to answer this puzzle. Uh, and this happened when uh, Pedro Santa Clara walked into my office in UCLA in about 2000 and uh, posed the puzzle. So I don't know the answer. And uh, we, worked, we actually wrote a paper called Two Trees to work out the answer. It took us three years to figure it out. Here's the answer. <laughs> the classic asset pricing theory says that if there's a general equilibrium behind it, 
that says, yes, in fact, we can all rebalance. And in the general equilibrium, what happens is we all sell. And what we do is, is those factories are now bigger. They're worth it. We take 20% of the factories uh, that are out there and we eat them because you're allowed to turn capital into consumption goods. So we take factories out of the ground and turn them into consumption goods. And in fact, we in aggregate do rebalance. So the total value of the stock market, what's, what's happened is the value of the stock market is, is price times quantity. Uh, the price went up. So what we do is we collectively reduce the quantity. And then we do collectively rebalance. That is crazy, you tell me. Yes, that is crazy. We live, our general equilibrium has irreversible capital stocks. It takes a while to issue more stocks and, and to, to not issue stocks and turn capital into consumption goods. We do not. So what has to happen is, in fact, uh, in a world where, where people want to do this, the 80-20, the expected return has to go up to make people want to hold the 80-20. The world cannot be IID. <laughs> uh, the, the only way to sustain 80-20 is that, is that there must be some momentum in stocks. And that's what we proved in two trees. Uh, that uh, if it goes up to 80-20, the expected return has to go up even more to get people to hold the 80-20. So the, the, it, the world can't be I, IID dividends don't give you IID returns when capital is, is uh, when capital sticks. So that's the paradox. And, and that's a great example of what's a good example there. How, Thinking about general equilibrium and economics really helps. But let's review the paradox. Start at 60-40, the market goes up, you're 80-20. All Wall Street advice says, good, we got to rebalance. Sell your stocks. We can't all sell. Somebody's got to buy. Who's buying? Oh, the irrational behavioral stupid liquidity trick. No. Does this make any sense? Who's buying at 80-20? Well, nobody's buying. So and that means one of two things. Either there's a general equilibrium where we can indeed all rebalance. We, we, the sense in which we sell our stocks is we eat the factories. If that's not true, if, if the general equilibrium is one where somebody's got to hold the 80%, then expected returns have to rise. We don't, in fact, have uh, IID dividend growth doesn't give involved. So, so, so to resolve that puzzle, you have to understand, we had consumption T versus consumption T plus one. You have to understand the distinction between, here's our rate of return, production technologies that look like this, production technologies that look like that, or, or production technologies. The classic case, in fact, in, it assumes a linear production technology that, that looks like that, and that's what determines the rate of return. So general equilibrium helps. Is this the, uh, and that, that uh, Nina has been challenging me for a while to find something useful out of all this. Uh, so here's a case where general equilibrium. We still have Nick with us. Uh, Nick, do you, do you have a final comment or question or anything we can help you with? You've been patient. I have a quick question, John. Sure. Uh, does CAPM work in the real market? Um, depends what you mean by work. And the answer I'll give you is, is uh, like all asset pricing models, which assets do you want to price? So after all this has been said and done, the CAPM works remarkably well on, let's see, uh, index futures. Because <laughs> right, index futures are just repackaging uh, their, their lever leveraged ETFs and index futures. Uh, the CAPM works great on that. Why am I saying that? A leveraged ETF is or index futures uh, are just leveraged versions of the market. So if I, if I have a beta versus expected return, and there's the market itself. If I create, there's RM. If I create a security which is uh, a 2RM minus RF, then that security is going to obey the cap beautifully. So that, that's kind of a silly example, but it does make it, it You're actually making the point very well that it doesn't really work. Well, it works <laughs> great for that set of securities. Here's another set of securities that it works great for. Um, uh, target date funds. So funds who invest in the market and the risk-free rate and that, that change their portfolio. So all the target date funds are going to be there because they're mixing market. And, now, let's do something less tricky. Size portfolios. The CAPM works great. Take the Fama French 10 size portfolios. Oh, I smell a problem set coming up. Take the Fama French 10 size portfolios, run the CAPM on them, and it works beautifully. Uh, the CAPM explains the size effect is just completely gone. The, the CAPM explains size. And there's a nice big spread of betas. This is nothing. 
the, the, the size effect looks like that these days. The gap end fails on the value effect and on momentum. Uh, now those are very, value and momentum are highly managed portfolios. So the gap end does, it, uh, on size portfolios, it looks about like that. On industry portfolios, it's okay. Uh, industry portfolios sort of look like that. Beta portfolios sort of look like that. The cap is okay on, on, on beta portfolios, on industry portfolios. It's great on size portfolios. It's spectacular on funds composed of the market and the history, and the history rate. It fails dramatically on some highly managed portfolios. Momentum, value, uh, um, bond. it also fails on things that aren't stocks. So bonds have their own kinds of risk premiums, put option premiums, carry trades, and so forth. So sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, but it, it, it certainly works well as an APT. It doesn't work that well as a, an absolute pricing model. Bottom line on the cap down. With that, I think we're done for the week. Uh, thank you, Adam and Nina. Uh, thank you, Nick, for joining us. Thanks, thank John. Forums and uh, good luck onwards and onwards for this week. And also, John, Bye. one last quick comment, literally yes. one minute. Uh, is it possible to arrange these sessions over the weekend? Oh, uh, Adam, Nina, let's ask a forum. I have nothing wrong with doing this Saturday morning. Uh, Adam and Nina, what do you think about it? Now, now that uh, we seem to be able to do these without Emily. Uh, holding our hands. Uh, okay, let's we'll we'll put it up to the forum, but uh, Saturday morning would be certainly possible for me. And uh, perfect. I'll, I'll that during the week. Yes, great. It, it, it's just that during the week, people are working, including myself. And I mean, generally, it's not possible to attend these, despite the fact that I have keen urge to to want. I do want to attend these, but I just can't because I'm at work. Yes, yes, no, that that work. Oh my gosh, we're academics. That never occurred to us. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Have a good weekend, okay. guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.